Thank you everyone for being here. Um, this is an event that will show that University of Chicago doesn't mean only finance, but also entrepreneurship. And we have a lot of people here that show you a bit of a different side. Um, so I'm looking forward to this. We have a great panel assembled here. And um, we're gonna jump right in. Um, well, before that, the structure of this event is gonna be um, panel for 45 minutes and then a speed networking for 45 minutes. Um, and the panel is right here. And I would like you to introduce yourselves for uh, a few sentences. And if you could start with Tina, please. My name is Tina Tang, and I'm a jewelry designer. I went to University of Chicago and graduated in 92. Uh, and uh, I did a major career change because I was working at Goldman Sachs as an equities trader before starting my own business. My name is Steve Giorgio. I have a marketing consulting firm called Geocom. Our focus is on what I think is probably the biggest problem facing businesses today, which is uh, customer loyalty. And there are a lot of trends uh, in the world today that are making customers disloyal, uh, including the internet, where you can comparative shop and price, uh, as well as outsourcing of customer service. And I'll get into this a little bit later. Uh, but prior to starting my consultancy, I was in the corporate world and I worked for uh, Citibank, uh, TWA, and also uh, Warner Communications. So I have both a corporate experience as well as an entrepreneurial experience. My name is, my name is David Spitz. I graduated from Chicago in 2006 and we make a drink that cures hangovers. And if, you, if you're questioning wh how, what's my background in order to do that, I'm a biomedical engineer before doing that, and I, I worked as a marketing consultant for a couple of years, so I know how to sell. Or I think I know how to sell. <laughs> You'll prove me wrong. <laughs> so, yeah. I'll get to speak. <laughs> there we go. Hi, I'm Pete Carrillo. Um, Similar to Tina? Uh -huh. uh, yeah. I also have a, a Wall Street background. I was a um, research analyst for 10 years and got completely burned out on that. And two years ago, I decided to start uh, a food packaged food product company. Um, and after a couple of years of that, recently I decided to get involved in a second startup. So I actually now am running one startup and heavily involved with a second startup that makes hand sanitizer dispensers. Hi, my name is Maurice Sandler. Um, I used to work at Goldman Sachs. Um, but I've had probably six or seven different lives, and most of them are entrepreneurial ventures, um, and have been fortunate to have a couple of them successfully uh, have IPOs and be sold to other people. So, um, and uh, I grew up in Chicago, uh, graduated from UC in '76, and uh, look forward to uh, telling you some stories. <laughs> Hi, my name is Drew Oliver, and I'm still not quite sure what I am. I was an entrepreneur right after I graduated from college, but none of, none of my ventures were successful. So I became a journalist, which was successful but didn't pay very well, and I got married. So I went to law school, and uh, I actually enjoyed being a lawyer, but I still had the entrepreneurial bug. Uh, shortly after I started working at Kirkland & Ellis, I started a company called Giant Microbes. Um, and I run that today, I'm the CEO, but I also still do a lot of the toy designing. Um, so I'm part toy designer, part CEO, part lawyer, journalist, and I have a lot of fun. I look forward to telling you about it. Thank you, everyone, that's, that's awesome. I think it's, it's amazing what a variety we have here of products and services, um, and also a variety of what stage these entrepreneurs are in. Um, so I think that we can learn a lot from what they have to say. I, I also want to mention in the back, you might have seen that already, there are some products um, from them. So if you want to take a closer look, I invite you to. My first question is to all of you. Not all of my questions will be to all of you. Um, but my first question um, takes you back to the point in time where you decided to be an entrepreneur. And I want to know, um, was that something that you knew all along that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? You say you started right after right after college, or was it an idea that hit you and you said, I, I can't do anything but really work on that? What, what was it that led, led to it? And maybe we'd start right with you. I did always want to be an entrepreneur. I mean, as a child, I ran lemonade stands and I made things on the beach out of shells and sold them and things like that. But then school took over and uh, I became very academic like many people. 
And it's, I think it's very difficult to, to be an entrepreneur. Um, and, but I tried various things right out of college without any experience and with really out any planning. And I don't think that's a, way to, a good way to go about doing it. But I certainly had the bug from the beginning. Um, and once I grew up and learned how to organize my thoughts, I was finally able to do it. Um. Interestingly, uh, I also uh, grew up in an environment where um, I never wanted to go work for a large company. Um, I thought it was stifling. And then after I graduated USC, um, I got offered, like everybody else, you know, McKinsey and the rest of the large consulting companies and investment banks and um, I turned them all down because I had a chance to go back into a family business that had in those days 12 different companies and we bought another five different companies and, and you know you get thrown into uh, manufacturing operations or you get thrown into marketing operations and you learn about all the issues so uh, for a good 10 years after graduating um, I got a lot of schooling uh, of hard knocks in screwing up on a lot of stuff and um, and then went off on my own and developed a number of businesses and we'll talk about that later. I'm actually quite a different version I think of these two guys although similar ended up a similar place. I, I grew up um, kind of a sort of a middle class life always sort of never had a lot of money we always had just enough to eat and kind of thing but never had the sort of luxuries and I think as I finished undergraduate, I, I wanted to actually go work on Wall Street and make all the money that all the investment bankers were making, all that kind of stuff. But I actually, that didn't happen. I actually ended up first at a startup in San Francisco. I was the first employee hired. And uh, and so that was kind of what I cut my teeth, actually, being at a startup and being sort of an entrepreneur, because everything you do is sort of, you know, there's no, there's no fluff work in that kind of environment. And after uh, after a couple, I mean, yeah, every. I remember ordering supplies at one point. I was like ordering supplies and setting up pens and papers on desks, and I was like, "This is an um, interesting you know, role here." Uh, but after a couple of years of that, one day I was talking to my dad, and he said, um, "You know, you always said you wanted to go. You're doing this job to get an MBA or whatever." And he's like, "Whatever happened to that?" And I kind of like sat there and I thought, "I mean, it wasn't like I had stopped thinking about an MBA, but I hadn't thought about it on a regular basis in time recently." And I started thinking, I was like, "You know what? He was right. This was supposed to be like a, you know, two three year deal where I went to business school, and so." That was towards the end of summer, I think, and I made a commitment to myself that by September I would sign up for like Kaplan and all that stuff. And anyway, I ended up getting an MBA and uh, left the, left the company a year later. Went, got an MBA, um, went to work for Morgan Stanley initially, uh, and then and actually was in a tech group there back in the days when it was cool to be an analyst and uh, in the tech group. Um, worked for Mary Meeker and like people like that if you know that name out there. Um, then went to Robertson Stevens, and then you know. The dot-com bubble, everything happened, burst in, uh, in September 11th happened, and the world kind of changed in the equities world, as I'm sure she knows well, especially if you're an analyst. The, the, the job and the career path and the ability to make money basically got cut down in half and worse than that. Um, so eventually I started thinking, like, this isn't what I want to do anymore. This is not fun. This is not interesting. It's not challenging. Everything I wanted, what I liked about this Wall Street role, Part of it was just sort of me wanting to go experience the New York world and that world was I'd done it and I'd been there and it wasn't fun anymore. But it took me about, I think, five more years to have the guts uh, to say, like, you know what, I'm leaving the comfort and cush of this corporate world of benefits and salary and bonus and everything else. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I didn't even leave, like, after the bonus. Like, I did the thing no one does. I left my job. I, I, I knew I was going to leave in early August, so I took a two-week vacation to Spain in mid-July, surpassed the vacation I'd even accrued. I actually went past my vacation allotment for the year, um, which nobody noticed at that time. Went to Spain for 15 days, came back, also called in sick on Monday, which nobody does, and then Tuesday gave my notice, made sure my paycheck was deposited, gave my notice, and I left uh, like 11 days later to start this food company. Um, so I think my longer story, my path is much different. I didn't plan on it, liked the startup environment, initially like the corporate environment, then hated it, and now I think at this point now I, don't, I can't see myself going back to the big company environment again. Um, and I've, you know, I just think it's, once you get a taste of it, and I think you guys probably have now, you can't, you can't go backwards like that. It's just you, you lose all your, lose your soul, I guess, actually, to me, frankly. So as far as I can rem as far as I can always remember, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. My my father's an entrepreneur. My grandfather was an entrepreneur, and I always kept seeking for the right time to take the plunge. 
So it was always about getting, getting jobs that had sort of steady paychecks. You knew what your responsibility was, albeit at the end of the day you felt that most of what you were doing was not getting the job done. You felt that you were pushing papers, you were getting stuff done that you didn't know where it was going. So why, why am I doing this R&D redesign? What, where is this syringe going to go? And I was always too scared of, well, when's the right time? Is the right time right out of college, after I get my MBA, after I work for a couple of years, after I'm married, I have kids, and my kids are going to college? And I said, no, the best time to do it is, is now. It's, it's just myself. I think I have a good network of, of people from Chicago. I've kept in touch with a lot of the faculty that have advised me throughout all, all stages of, of my company. And you said, let's, let's, let's be crazy. Let's write a business plan and see if I can get some money. Once I was able to raise some, some capital from friends, fools, and family, and there were fools initially, <laughs> and I, I said, OK, let's, it's, it's not that crazy. Let's, let's move on and do it. And I've loved every single day. I've loved the, the ups, the downs, the days where you feel like, why am I even doing this? Why, why, don't I keep my, why didn't I keep my steady paycheck? Yes, I hate it every day. I hate it. 50 people telling me what to do, and each one of them contradicting each other. And just said, look, this is, this is the best thing that I can do with my life. I, I've, I have the preparation. I have a very good support group. And we'll take it a day at a time. And I've never learned as much as I have learned over the last two years since I've launched this company. So not only is it, I mean, it's a, you give up a lot of, of time and a lot of the things that you used to do when you can plan out your day a lot better. But in terms of the learning that I've, that I've done, I think it's as exponential, if not more so, than the two years that I spent doing my, my MBA program. And I, I, I look around, I, I feel that I'm the, the youngest person in the, in the panel. What, are, are there instances where I feel that, I mean, should I, should I have worked a couple more years in, in marketing or in operations? And maybe things would have come out a, a better way. Absolutely, but at the same time, I don't regret plunging into the entrepreneurship career because I think that the personal rewards and satisfactions you get by getting the job done yourself is incredible. I don't think my experience was so much that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just knew that I was very independent thinking, which is not always the best thing to be in a corporate life. <laughs> And I worked for a company in my last uh, corporate position. I worked in a company that was uh, staging an IPO for all the wrong reasons. And uh, that actually you know, came to bear that uh, the company's IPO was not successful. It actually never even took off. And a lot of bad mistakes were made. And along the way, it just occurred to me and dawned on me that um, the company's goals and objectives were so contrary to my own and that uh, I was really the person who was responsible for my well-being. And that's when I really made the decision uh, to go off on my own. And I did have some attractive offers uh, from other companies, but I decided that if I didn't do it at that point in time in my career, I would never do it. And I guess it was that independent streak of mine that made me make the decision to go on my own and, uh, and see whether I could be successful. I took the traditional route pretty much all my life, you know, going to college, working at an investment bank, and I, uh, about five years in at Goldman, um, on the, I just, I just started not feeling very happy. Not, not like extremely unhappy, but sometimes it takes a situation where you start really thinking about your life, like, is this what I want to do? And for me, I was one of the few women on the floor, and most of the guys, I would say, you know, their wives didn't work. Um, you know, they had their job. Uh, it's a challenging, you get paid very well, but you're never home. And I would say of my entire floor, only two guys loved, loved what they did. Like every weekend would scour barons, read all, everything they had to, not because they had to, because they loved to. And that's what I wanted to feel about what I did every day. And everyone else on the floor, I know they just did it because it's, you know, it's challenging, you, you know, whatever, it's what is expected. So. Um, I made the decision, decision to leave because I'm like, I'm already at the best place that I can be. Switching to a different department or to another firm is not going to change anything. And uh, I decided to quit, kind of having a couple ideas of what I wanted to do, but it wasn't really well formed. And I think sometimes in life, the universe kind of points you towards the way because certain things start working out. 
and um, and that's how it, it came to be for me that um, that I decided to do my own company. And once you do it, you do not want to work for someone else. It is so nice to work for yourself, do everything on your terms, run the company the way you do, treat employees as well as you want to treat them. And and that's the nice thing. I get I, I learn from great bosses, and 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 I can pass that on uh, to all the employees that I have. So um, that's, I think, the best thing. Like, I would, even right now, when I have, like, a very difficult time, I would never, ever go take a $2 million job <laughs> over what I do today. If I could, I'd add one thing onto what she said, actually. <clears throat> um, if you're sitting out there wanting with corporate jobs and you're thinking, you're coming to this to sort of hear, like, some sort of motivation or some, re like, how can I go out and do this with a secret. I think one thing she said, which I totally agree with is, I, I think I spent too much time trying to think of like the perfect idea, like figure out the perfect idea before I left the security of the job. And I don't think there is the perfect idea because nothing is guaranteed to work in, this, in the world. I mean, there's lots of competitive forces and all sorts of things happen, credit crunches come along, whatever, which we'll talk about that later. But um, you ha if you have an inkling to do it and you have any sorts of ideas at all or think you could just, I mean, take the plunge, quit the job, and go work on the idea. Don't sit around thinking you're going to figure it out like from your, your you know, eight to, eight to seven job or whatever. You're not going to find the time to really do serious work and research it unless you're extraordinary and just sort of like put everything else aside and spend your nights and weekends focused. But I would, I would say don't wait around to get the perfect idea. You're going to wake up 55 or 60 and go, wait a minute, I got the idea, you know, don't wait. This is great because it actually feeds right into my next question, um, which is for, for PU and Andrew and Stephen, and that is how much, how much does the idea matter and how much does it matter how you actually do it? So strategy versus implementation. Um, what's your feeling on that? And Peter, if you want to expand on that since you started. So how much does the idea matter? Um, yeah. Um, well, obviously not every idea is going to work. So I think there has to be an idea that you know you've thought through a little bit and you can't find you you, you got to be at least not be able to poke holes in it yourself and have some of your closest circle of friends and you know if you have the idea kick it around a little bit have it start, i started with my closest circle of friends first in my case the first startup was again a packaged food product it's actually mexican salsa it's back in the corner back there um and at first, I thought it was a ridiculous idea. My dad started the idea for thought of the idea first, and I was like, "I'm not going to get into the packaged food business. I know nothing about that." But I had some friends try it, and everybody loved it. And I had some wider circle of friends, and pretty soon I had people who didn't know me, so I would get objective response, and I couldn't find anybody who didn't love it. Every, there was no even like, "As yeah, okay," it was like everybody loved it. I was like, "Okay, well, that's a good idea." I think um, now there's other parts of the story. You can't just make a just because a product is good, whether it's good tasting or functions well or a great toy or whatever. It doesn't mean it's going to work. Yeah, there's other things to consider, obviously, on the supply side and uh, merchandising cost, y your budget. But um, um, and I forgot the, I forgot your original question. Actually, now sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, idea for some implementation. So I think, yeah, the idea has to be a good one. You got to make sure that the idea is not just easily poo-pooed by people. But after that, I mean, implementation is that's everything. I mean, you do definitely have to go out there and, and execute. And uh, I think probably most people would agree it's it's more hard work than it is smarts a lot of it. I mean, you just have to be willing to have a lot of energy and go do a lot of stuff. Your smarts will keep you from making too stupid of mistakes, but the implementation and, and execution on a daily basis, including like Saturdays and Sundays, is like part of, I think, how you make it in the end. You've you got to keep plugging along and pushing, and, and you've got to shove it through even when it doesn't want to be go through. You know, customers don't want to buy your product. You've got to find a way to make them buy it. So I think implementation is huge, actually. Thank you. What about you, Steve? It's great to have an uh, outstanding idea. Uh, it certainly uh, helps in terms of success, but I really think it's in the details and the implementation because there's always uh, an opportunity for the next company to come into the marketplace and, and do it better in terms of execution. And a lot of good ideas have probably fallen by the wayside because they were poorly executed. So I would put more weight on the execution uh, than the idea itself. Uh, what the one caveat that if it's a great, great, great idea, like a Google, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot more likely to succeed. But uh, a lot of things have not succeeded because of poor implementation. Yeah, just my, 
just a comment about Google, and I, I'm not an expert on it in any way, but I remember when Google started, I was using Yahoo search engine, and I think they had a huge market share. And Google came in, and they were kind of doing the same thing, just a little bit better, as I recall. And But what they did was they implemented it really well. You found the search that you wanted. and. So it is a great idea. There, I, my sense of their idea was that it was a really streamlined interface, um, and so they 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 were only serving the data that people wanted, and I, that's why I wanted to comment on it, which is that staying focused on your idea, I think, is very important um, because it it does allow you to test it off other people, um, certainly as you're getting started. But then the other thing is, and this is what I found, um, if you can start it moving forward. Um, and you're not finding problems, and you can start to get a little motion traction, um, ideas will start to come to you, and other people will bring them to you, and you get sort of a virtuous circle. And so you need a seed idea and the germ of an idea, but sometimes when you research it or when you start to push it forward, it develops and changes. Giant Microbes, just as an example, was uh, it started with well, sort of as a toy and sort of as an educational product, um, and in fact, it was very hard to sell initially when we were going around to um, distributors and retailers, a lot of skepticism. And it was hard to, to move it forward because it, it did have a lot of aspects to it. Um, but then as it started to, to, to grow, um, people started coming to us, pharmaceutical companies and people like that who were bringing us ideas about ways to expand and grow. And so. I, they're all important. I, I, I do think implementation, if that means research and, and uh, talking about and exploring your idea, is probably much more important than the initial seed, only because it is likely to change as you move it forward. And by the way, Google wasn't able to get funding in the beginning easy. It wasn't such an obvious idea back then. They, they didn't have an easy time getting money for, I think, a couple of years, at least if I recall correctly. So it's not like that was obvious in the beginning either. Well, what Oh, I just wanted to add, I think when, uh, for your own business, you're the heart and soul. So you know how when a company grows and once they get sold and then the original founder's not there, things change a lot? In the end, it's all about you, because if it's your idea and your passion, that's what's going to get it through. Like even with Spanx, uh, I think, you, I don't know if you all know her story, she had that idea. She went to all these uh, hosiery manufacturers to see if they would manufacture, and they all thought it was ridiculous. Nobody would do it. But she kept at it for two years until she found someone who would actually do it. So without her passion for it and believing in it, it would never have happened. Um, speaking of Google, and I actually wanted to ask you, Tina, Google is an example of very young entrepreneurs with basically zero business experience. They had a great idea, but, but zero um, experience versus acquiring skills and learning and then starting a business. Um, what's your feel on that, and what would you recommend for people here? I don't think there's a right or wrong for any of that because it's kind of whatever your life's path is, whatever you've done before is going to add to the experience of what you're doing for your business. So uh, working on Wall Street was helpful because Goldman has a certain business ethic that they practice, which I, um, I think has left an imprint on me, which I found very helpful. But um, that doesn't necessarily mean that anyone who's coming from that is going to do the same thing. So um, you know, I, you just work with what you got. <laughs> I'd like to comment on that because I think software and the internet um, gives you an opportunity where you could have limited business experience. Um, and I, it's interesting that other than what you and I are doing, Peter, that we got products sitting at the table versus a service company or a major new industry. And I don't know what your interests are out there. Um, I look at probably 500 companies a year because I'm also doing venture capital. And um, going back to this, this, your whole point is there's more than just having your idea because I think if you can find a situation where there is the wind behind you. Um, we built a telephone company in China before there was cell phones. We built, so therefore, for China to want to develop and Russia to want to develop and join the 20th century and do commerce, they needed us. So therefore, there was a pent-up demand that took off immediately. And therefore, we had the ability to capture what we viewed as an opportunity. And I, you haven't used the word opportunity yet. 
in this conversation. It's very interesting because um, that's half the game. There's no question, as Tina knows, if all of a sudden she develops a piece of silver jewelry that hits a certain hot trend that's going on, the wind's behind her and she'll, and she'll be able to be carried with it, even though it might not be the best product. And it might not be priced exactly right, but there's a major demand happening. So when you're starting to think about where you want to go and how you want to do it, I would clearly take a look at that industry and the opportunity within the industry. And there's also a couple things that I've heard, which is really important, is in terms of execution, you got to think about how you want to operate your life and how you want to deal with your fellow employee. And you heard the Saturday and Sunday nights. It's, it is serious, serious stuff. Because it turns out um, your days become 20-hour days. You can't believe it, but it really becomes 20-hour days, as we all sit in here know, right? And so there's pluses and minuses to all this. Um, and then there's a question that nobody's brought up is I've wanted to change the world in a little way. I want to change a lot of lives in a little way. And each one of us has that opportunity sitting here at this table. And, and that's part of the, uh, the return we get out of doing what we're doing. Great. Thank you for bringing that up. And I think the notion of, of having a break, having the wind behind you, is, is truly very interesting. And um, the flip side of that, what about if you don't have the wind behind you? If you have a great idea and you're doing a great job, and then there's the recession. Um, Debbie, maybe you want to comment on that, and all of oh, you. Uh, <laughs> I had a venture. I had a telecom venture in oh, 12 countries. Um, we found some technology that could track you, um, could track a car, could track an asset. Um, <coughs> And in parts of the world, uh, whether it was China or, or Brazil or Mexico, there's a tremendous amount of theft. And the insurance companies love this product because, man, oh, man, they were losing locomotives. Can you imagine a locomotive getting stolen or uh, a large, I don't know, 20 ton, 50 ton caterpillar being stolen? Oh, you can put this thing in it, and no matter where they hit it, um, we could find it. Great idea, right? except for the forces that were against us was something called the mafia. And the guys who were actually stealing it were the police. So, um, and we came and I, we had put uh, $75 million into this really interesting technology and had 150 employees around the globe. Um, and the telecom bubble came. And guess what? Uh, we hit the wall. And there's not a damn thing you can do. And you kind of, and we'll talk, you have a question later, but it was the hardest thing that ever happened to me because I had 150 employees and 150 friends. I had to go find them jobs because we're, I had to let them go. Um, and there are people in China, and there are people in India, and there are people in uh, 12 more countries. And I wanted to make sure that when we did let them go, because uh, we ran out of cash, uh, that they we helped them find the next thing. And so you talk about values, and you talk about what you want to do with your life. You got to think about those people who are t who are taking a risk with you, and that's a really important element too. I, I probably could add some interesting part here because I have the two store the, the what is it the tale of two tales whatever. Um, so I started a premium food company in uh, the fall of 2007 when the economy was going just fine, actually. Things se seemed to be going just fine, actually, um, although they weren't. So you start a premium food product, and then, you know, just as you get going, the economy starts to slow down, and stores get risk-averse at carrying new products and everything. So I spent much of 2008 with a headwind, not a tailwind, um, and continued on through, you know, a little bit. I mean, I, we've done modestly well, given all those forces, mostly because me just, again, pushing against the, that wind. But the funny thing is, as I've, um, and I, th I don't think I mentioned the second company I'm working with, but the second company I'm working for now is called TerraBoost, and it's a hand sanitizer dispenser company. And long story short is it's not like a little Purell one. It's actually bigger, better looking, and has a place for media ads on it. So it's a very different business model. But this thing has a little thing called H1N1 as a major uh, tailwind. I mean, 
it's not even a tailwind. It's like the jet stream in the middle of winter going from San Fran to New York or whatever. We we literally, I mean, we can't keep up with uh, we can't keep up with the demand right now. I mean, nobody can in this industry. And it's, I think I heard today that, like year over year, like a company like Purell is doing four times the revenue they were doing one year ago right now, and such that they've actually they're out of supply. So everyone's out of supply, and we're small, so we're actually not out of supply, sort of. But we do hit days or weeks where we kind of are out of supply temporarily. But anyways, that that's a. The tailwinds and headwinds, you can't, you can't plan for that, especially if the idea is going to take a while to plant, to build it out and do it. I mean, like, uh, you just, you can't always, you just, you, you can get a little bit of luck there sometimes too, but the tailwind for us right now is phenomenal. The headwind for this also was a little bit, wasn't terribly strong, but it was there enough that it made things challenging, but um, yeah, you just, it's a little bit of a luck there. I mean, the luck is, luck is real. Yeah. So I guess two, two really big challenges that we, that we have faced one, one has to do with the economy. One has had to do with, I guess, a, a, a problem that was manifested when, when Coca-Cola first launched the new Coke. When you do a lot of market research, sometimes you get very misleading information. And the, the core of our product is, I mean, does it cure my hangover? Is it effective? And just going around and asking random people within our target demographic, if I can give you the cure for hangovers, I mean, do you, do you care what it tastes like? How, how important from zero to, to 10 is taste? If it works, who cares? The taste doesn't matter. I was giving, I was giving people samples of the taste. And I mean, the, if, if, if you're going to take a sample, and please, please do, just be aware that, it, that it, it's salty and it smells like vitamins. If I'm able to explain that to every single person that tries it, they're expecting it. In fact, a one, to the, the big challenge once we had the product out in the market after doing all the market research was, okay, we've got $60,000 worth of inventory here, which was a very substantial part of our uh, fund capital. And, and, our, and the college students who are our main target, they, they don't like it and they're not drinking it. And rather than saying Aftershot is the greatest thing ever, they're like, Aftershot tastes like crap. I'm not gonna drink this <laughs> thing anymore. And how do you? I mean, how do you? How do you overcome this if you're not a multi-billion-dollar company like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, where you can just do a reformulation and relaunch it? I mean, if if you can't make this product work, you're starting from zero again. How are you going to look at your investors and be like, I need I need more money because people didn't like the flavor? So that's that's when we decided to get creative and and run a run a campaign with college students, which is pretty much. Aftershot tastes like ass, but it works. So when you're, when, and, and again, the, the demographic that we were using fit that marketing message. It was very effective. My investors were very skeptical at the beginning. Once the results started, started coming out, they were, they were very, very, very impressed with the fact that this was something, it's, it's, all, it's all marketing. And I, I guess I'll, I'll talk about marketing and the key things about my company in in a few moments, but it's 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 a product. It's a, it was a product design flaw, to call it that. Which for, fortunately we were able to somehow medi mediate with marketing. The other problem facing us with with the economy is we d we decided to make the cap the capital call in two stages. One for proof, proof of concept, which included develop development of the unit model. And once we were able to do that, we would raise the second part of the of, of capital, which had less risk. And it was more to repeat that model in in our case in several colleges. Everything was going great. The economy hit. We need some more money to replicate this, which has demonstrated success. I'm sorry, the money that I promised you is not there anymore. So then, what do you do? So if I mean the the biggest thing that has impacted our company is the fact that. We have we have a marketing plan that cannot that is at a very small scale, but given that it is a consumer consumer product, it requires very have heavy marketing expenditures, which banks are not going to fund. You need to raise private capital, and because it's a consumer product, a lot of investors because it's not protectable through a patent or through innovation or through a very high barriers to entry aside from marketing expenditures. It's very tough to get, so that's I guess a big challenge. If you're thinking of opening of, of starting up your own business, 
make sure you have extremely reliable sources of capital to, uh, could, to, to, push it, to push it forward. Thank you for that perspective. And with that, I'd like to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. And I see one in the back. I'll, I'll take a stab on that. For, for a, a food product, a patent, a patent's not going to do anything for you. It, there's, there's very, very easy ways to, to go around that patent. The scope is going to be too narrow, and you're putting forth too much information. Most of, mo if, you, if you pick up a bottle of aftershock and you look at the ingredients, I mean, you look at them, it's like, how can this work for my hangover? It's so simplistic. I mean, a lot, of, a, lot of the fact, a lot of the effectiveness of it comes from the fact that these ingredients are everyday ingredients. The real secret is in the production. What's the ratio of each of these ingredients? So it's more of a trade secret. And when you look at the big successes in the beverage industry, Gatorade, Coca-Cola, Red Bull, those are not patented. On the flip side, I'm, I'm currently considering a, a, a separate venture, which is in medical devices, where the most important thing is it, it's, it's a fairly simple technology, which could be very easily replicated unless it's protected by very, very strong intellectual property. So in terms of me considering investing in that, in, in that company, that is the number one question for me. Is, is this something that can be protected and Stryker is not going to come tomorrow and just piggyback off of our product and use their sales mechanism to drive us out of the market? We actually, uh, in TerraBoost, we actually, this is a gigantic problem for us right now. Uh, I mean, everybody in the room knows that H1N1 is a big deal, and it's a big deal globally right now. D different countries care at different levels, but everybody does care around the world. Go to a trade show, and you see somebody from 25 countries come up to the booth, every single person, every single person from Guatemala to Brazil, Denmark, Germany, like I've talked to people from all these countries, and they all care, look at it, interested, whatever. We're, we're literally right now, thinking about and considering just avoiding doing business in, in ma many major parts of the world to put off further copycats of our product. Because while we do have patents, the concept can be copied without breaking our patent. You can just build a different looking one and have media ad space on it and thereby have the same product. Now the good thing is you can't do this too quickly. It takes at least you know four or five, six months minimum if you have experience in doing this and writing supply channels. and that kind of stuff, and the FDA is a little bit of a hassle, as he probably knows, um, so there's some hassles in there, but like Purell, for example, is the industry giant in our industry, and I mean industry giant, like there's nobody even close to Purell in this industry. They don't have a product like ours, they can't get one quickly, they actually have purchased twice, they'd like to get our product and have a way for us to give it to them, sell it to them, license it to them, whatever. Um, so for the next few months, though, we're still protected. As soon as somebody else has this problem, it's a, this cop, uh, product is a major problem. But the key point I'm saying is it's funny how we have to, we're going to basically avoid doing market uh, business in certain markets. Uh, I'll just make an obvious one, like China or somewhere. We're not going to do business there anytime soon. What's the point? As soon as it lands there, someone will see it. They'll go copy it. And we don't have enough manpower or resources or anything to go conquer China. It's a very daunting market anyway for many things. But that's an issue where your, your question is, it definitely matters in a lot of places, and in the case of us, we're, we're basically focused on a market where we can sue people or cut them off from distribution of the cartridges that we put inside the machine. That's a very important part of it. But once you get overseas and you can't monitor, they could copy all sorts of things, including our solution. Just put their own solution in the machine, and there goes our razor blades. You know, now we're just selling razors, basically, which is not what we want to do. So I don't know about you guys, but that's, for us, it's a big deal. For my salsa business, it's like he said, it's in the formulation. You could try, you, any of you could try to sit there for five days copying my salsa recipe, you'd never get it quite right. And you would after a while get close, but you'd never get it quite right because you don't know the proportions and especially with something spicy. Like it very much matters which ones are in which proportion, that kind of thing. So for foods, one thing, for a product, it's different. I don't know if you picked up the subtlety of what he just said because he's so right. They both are really right. Um, talking from experience. The problem with entrepreneurs, we don't have the resources. We don't have the resources to go fight, forget China, England, Germany. We just don't have the ability to do it. And therefore, um, stopping a copycat is, is, is almost impossible for a small entrepreneurial company. Yeah, you can sue them, but you won't be around when the, uh, you can collect because it'll take you five years or seven years or longer. So um, it's a real issue. And, um, and, the, and the point on a medical device, or I'm working on a hydrogen generator, um, 
The patent is all everything. It's it's really really everything. But without a piggy bank behind it, forget it, because it doesn't. The big boys will come in, copy it, and they'll wait to see if they can grind you down to nothing. So that's an issue. So if you don't mind, so in terms of depending, it, it varies a lot by by product. Because one thing is, it takes a long time for for big companies to emulate what's happening in the market. So, I mean, you're gonna get a few years head start. If your technology depends on a 10 year horizon, then the patent becomes hugely important, like for a pharmaceutical company. With, I mean, with, when, when people tell me, who are you afraid of with, with, with coming and copying your technology? When's Gatorade, when's Red Bull gonna come after you? I'm, I'm not worried about those guys. I'm worried about a guy in a frat house saying, ooh, this is great. Let's just make some aftershot and, and sell it under whatever other name. So it's it's more nimble organizations, and certainly, I mean, with with the patents, it's not so much getting an getting a an airtight patent. It's also having the resources to fight the the vultures when they do come around. It's great to have all these perspectives. I think we're going to have to keep it to two answers per question, just because I've heard that there is a Yankees game that everyone wants to see. <laughs> um, so next question, please. I'll start on that because I did not take any funding. Um, uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to start the company was so that I could work for myself. And as I think when you take funding, you immediately start working for somebody else, although at, at a greater distance than when you're at a, somebody else's company, literally. Um, and in my case, the, it was one of the reasons that I selected the product, if you will. I was trying to think of an idea specifically that I could fund on my own. Um, at least to a point at which it would either become self-funding or later in the day to take in, uh, additional funding. But I, I do think it's a difficult question because we've had many instances where there were things that we could do now if we took funding, but if we waited, the company would probably grow and we'd be able to do it ourselves later. And judging that time frame, I found to be very difficult. Um, so that's, I think the issue uh, remains with you, not just at the beginning, but all the way along. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, and uh, I've you know funded my business uh, entirely myself and through the profits of the business, and you know that's part of being independent, and just have been very reluctant to give up that independence. And it's a formula that's worked for me, and uh, you know I will continue to do that. Um, but you know it really depends upon the scale that you want your business to be, and at some point in time you do have to make the decision whether you seek outside resources to, to build that scale. So I think it's really a question of how large you want the business to be. I, uh, I volunteer at the steering committee for the Metropolitan Opera, the Young Associates. Um, in regards to that, what's your specific question? Yes, uh, the question is I think your your business experience is always helpful. Like for the steering committee for the Met, you know they're always looking for new members, and then. Uh, that's the goal, and so they plan events. They, um, you know, they're looking for donations for the events. So everything that you do for your business is uh, definitely applicable there, um, and it's all volunteer. So everyone that's on the steering committee, I think, their strengths all come together to to make to achieve the goals. So it's extremely helpful, and I think it also is nice for you to step out of what you do every day to do something, uh, volunteer for something you really enjoy. Again, for me, like the the packaged food business, I didn't have experience in that area. So f when I pitched to investors, A, I pitched in January of this year, which was about absolutely the worst time in the last 25 years probably to pitch to any raising money from anybody in the world because four months before, I had about $100,000 offered to me from various friends. Like they would write a check right then. And I was like, no, 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 because I wanted to get, I wanted to be able to raise a higher valuation, like we're all talking about. You don't want to give up control. so. I waited four months, and it was four months too long, way too long. Um, and the, in the second business, though, it's quite different. Where we, um, I think, the biggest issue we have, which he's going to be well aware of, is that 
when you raise money, sometimes strings come attached. The best money comes with the most strings attached. Well, that's the worst kind of, if, you're, if, you're, if you want to keep control, then you don't want that money. You want what, the dumb money. You want the money that sort of gives you money and lets you do your thing, but that it doesn't usually come in, in big of quantities, and it comes in multiple people that you didn't have to deal with their emails and phone calls and whatever. So the challenge, I think, when you're trying to keep control is raise money, but without people wanting like buyouts and all kinds of options, they want to stick in there to control you. And we had a company recently, a guy who wanted, he wanted to be matched with like warrants for every dollar of capital he gave us. We're like, wait a minute, that's like 50% dilution, like 50% dilution right there. So we turned that money away and it was a lot of money actually. It was $400,000 in this environment. That's a lot of money. So. It depends on how much money you need. And, and there are, um, in today's world, unfortunately, um, when you're seeking between zero and five million, it's really, really difficult because there really is not a organized uh, structure to have you easily get it. Uh, the investment bankers can't make enough money on a $2 million fee to really spend a lot of time with you. So therefore, what will happen is they'll take you around to a lot, a lot of meetings, but it's not intense. It's really not of the level that you can talk to a decision maker for a million bucks. That's first. That's really hard. And as you well know, I mean, I've seen some guys who've gone around in 100 meetings and come up with zero. So it, it's, it's very frustrating. Um, but that being said, that's the name of the game. And, and <coughs> you've got to go figure out and how to be creative. We're all and I'm assuming everybody sitting here is really creative and really desirous of trying to do to get something off the ground. Um, as he just said, you, would have, you should have taken the 400K. And, it, and there's an old phrase, don't be a pig. If somebody's offering you your 400K, grab it right now. I mean, because it's on the table. And, um, and I've, I, I could talk to you about 30 million such situations where, and people said, oh, I don't like that. And the world changes next week. Things happen. But what, let's talk about what people are looking to hear. Because, you know, have you done it before? Uh, is it clear and concise? Is it substantial, right? Can you, I mean, I can keep going right down the list of anything you've heard when you went to school is it's really, there's a, there's a form and, in, in a, I mean, people like all of us have gone and they want to know the answers to the questions and they want it clearly and they want it succinctly and, um, and, and what kind of return are you going to get really? And why do you say that, really? And, and just solid questions that in 20 minutes, not 45 minutes, not an hour, but if you can talk about your proposition. I mean, I had, a, as you looked at my resume, you know I was really close to a really very famous financier. And George used to say, give it to me in a page. Now, if you can't communicate your idea in a page, then you're off. Give it to me in two, less than 200 words. What's the idea? How am I going to make money? And why should it be you? See if you can do that in a page. And, and truthfully, if you can be able to do that and do your story in less than 20 minutes in a really convincing way, then you got a chance. Um, great questions and great answers. And um, I'm hoping that if you join us afterwards and if you can stay maybe some of you a few minutes longer than I know that at least uh, 11 questions are left. So you can take <laughs> care of those. Uh, I'm in from Chicago from Career Advising and Planning Services and want to thank all of you for being here for what is part of Career Month. So this panel and the events tonight are part of a new series of events taking place in 10 cities around the world in the month of November. It's fantastic that you're all here for that. I also want to um, first and foremost thank our organizers, David Hogan, who could not be here this evening, Carmen Magar, our moderator, and uh, Monica Schroer, and especially thank our panelists for sharing all their expertise. Um, so Andrew, Peter, Stephen, David, Morris, and Tina, thank you very much for being here. Um, also wanted to let you know about alumni career services at the University of Chicago. There are career services available to all alumni. Um, those include free career advising sessions if you're thinking about a transition. If you are not in Chicago, those are available over the phone. 
Um, also networking tools, there's a LinkedIn group, there's a new job board, so there are lots of opportunities for networking and for career advancement for alumni. Also, if you are at an organization looking for interns or looking for full-time hires, we also want to talk to you. So in terms of helping current students, helping the next generation of Chicago alumni, I will be here and I'm happy to talk to you about that as well and can answer questions you have about what alumni career services and what CAPS does. And finally, in terms of entrepreneurship and volunteering, we recognize that entrepreneurship obviously is a very hot topic right now. So if you'd like to see more events like this one tonight, please stop and speak with Allie Goldstein, who is standing in the doorway. She's the Associate Director of Alumni and Constituent Relations and has a great impact on events like this. And if you would like to volunteer in general um, with the New York Club, with Career Services, please feel free to talk to Ali or the other club volunteers that are here this evening, Monica Schroer from the New York Club, and Michael Rosen and Corey Perlmutter for the New York Booth Club are all here and can talk to you about volunteer opportunities with the university. So thank you again for being here. We are gonna move on to the speed networking portion in the evening, and I wanna turn it over to Michael and Corey for that.